Welcome to the Carnegie Museum. My name is Jackie Laffey, and I'm the regional representative for the city of Pittsburgh. My office is located on the south side, East Carson Street. Archie's with me today. I wonder where our guide is. Oh, that's right. Here I am. Hi. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Archie. Welcome to Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. You are here in our Oakland facility, which is Carnegie Museums of Art and Carnegie Museum of Natural History. There is so much to see and discover and explore inside, but today we are going to focus on the world premiere exhibition, Dinosaur Armor. Follow me. This is one of our permanent exhibits, Dinosaurs in Their Time. And this is one of my very favorite rooms because this is where we have Dippy. Dippy. Diplodocus carnegii. Welcome to the world premiere exhibition, Dinosaur Armor. Together, we're going to explore the exhibit and learn all about living and extinct creatures that have armor. We're going to go behind the scenes and even meet a few of our museum scientists along the way. There are all kinds of armor, and we can observe them in living things around us, as well as in the fossil record. Armor helps animals protect themselves, communicate, and even in combat with other animals. It can take many different forms, and these adaptations that help animals survive in their environment have evolved in many different groups, including fish, reptiles, dinosaurs, and even mammals. To introduce us to the topic of armor, let's talk to Dr. Matt Lamana, head of vertebrate paleontology and our main museum dinosaur scientist. Thanks, Jess. Some dinosaurs on display here at the museum have different kinds of armor, and that armor served many functions. It could be for protection, display, fighting, or many times more than one of these. In some dinosaurs, that armor is formed from bones that actually grow out of the skin. Bony plates and spikes that grow out of the skin, rather than being connected to the rest of the skeleton, form a passive defense for the animals that evolve them. The fancy word for bones that grow from the skin is osteoderm, with osteo meaning bone and derm meaning skin. Here we have two ankylosaurs, commonly known as armored dinosaurs, called Gastonia and Poloroplites. They lived at separate times during the Mesozoic era, or age of dinosaurs, and they look pretty different from one another. But they both have features that show they're closely related within the larger armored dinosaur group, a smooth head and a tail that doesn't end in a club. By contrast, this dinosaur, called the Kynocephalus, has a spiky head and a big club on the end of its tail. It's from a different branch of the ankylosaur family tree, and its club tail is a key identifier. Its tail club gave this armored dinosaur a more active form of defense. It could swing its tail to scare off or even hit animals that might be attacking. Now let's look at another dinosaur with osteoderms, the famous Stegosaurus. This isn't an ankylosaur, but it has some features in common with them because it's a distant relative. Check out those big bony plates on the top of its neck, back, and tail. As in ankylosaurs, those plates are osteoderms. What the plates of Stegosaurus were for is something that we paleontologists have argued about ever since the discovery of this dinosaur more than 130 years ago. Some scientists have claimed that the plates were for defense, but they seem pretty thin and weak for that. Others have proposed that they helped the animal maintain its body temperature. But nowadays, most of us agree that the plates served at least partly for display. That is, to show off to other Stegosaurus or to warn away predators. Without a time machine, it's very hard to know for sure. Like some of its ankylosaur relatives, Stegosaurus had an active defense too. Massive spikes at the end of its tail. When a predator attacked, this dinosaur could swing its spiked tail. If it connected, the damage could be catastrophic. 
There's even been a tailbone of the meat-eating dinosaur Allosaurus found that has a hole that seems to have been made by a stegosaur tail spike. Now let's investigate one last group of dinosaurs with armor, the Ceratopsians, or horn-faced dinosaurs. Here we have skulls of four different Ceratopsian species. As you can see, their armor takes different shapes. This is one of the biggest clues we paleontologists use to tell different horned dinosaur species apart. For instance, the size, shape, and number of horns on the head can vary from species to species. It could even change over the lifetime of one Ceratopsian individual as that animal grew up. And now, I have a question for you. What are some ways that horns help animals living today to survive? That's right, modern animals such as antelope, rhinos, some lizards, and many more use their horns to defend against predators, fight each other for territory or mates, and show off to one another, often to intimidate rivals or attract mates. You might wonder, why'd I ask you that question? Here's why. Because we paleontologists don't have a time machine, and therefore can't observe living, breathing Ceratopsians behaving, the next best thing we can do is to look at today's animals with horns, see how they use those horns, and use those observations to come up with hypotheses, educated guesses, as to how Ceratopsians might have used theirs. The big bone, actually multiple bones fused together, on the back of the Ceratopsian skull is called a frill. Horn dinosaur frills come in many sizes, shapes, and ornamentation patterns that, like horns, often vary between species and through the growth of a single species. What do you think the frill might have been for? Paleontologists used to think that horn dinosaur frills were mostly for defense from predators, and they probably were used for defense some of the time. But, like the plates of Stegosaurus, frills, especially the long, elaborate frills with big openings, such as those of the middle two species here, may have been too delicate to have formed an effective defense from large meat eaters. Instead, many paleontologists think the frills were mostly for display, used to advertise to other members of the same species. Think of the giant billboards that you often see by the side of the road when you're riding in a car. Just like many billboards, Ceratopsian frills may even have been brightly colored to attract attention. And finally, here we have the most famous Ceratopsian of all, Triceratops. Can you spot any differences between the skull of Triceratops and those of the other Ceratopsian species you saw? If you've got sharp eyes, you might see that, unlike those of other Ceratopsians, the frill of Triceratops is solid. It has no openings and was therefore probably stronger than those of some other species. Nobody really knows why this is, but it could be because, unlike those other horned dinosaurs, Triceratops lived in the same habitat as one of the biggest and most powerful predatory dinosaurs of all time, T-Rex. So maybe the frill of Triceratops offered this Ceratopsian the added protection it needed. If you grow up to be a paleontologist, maybe you can be the person who answers this question. Okay, back to you, Jess. Thank you so much, Matt. Now let's turn our attention to living animals that have armor. For that, we go to vet tech Leslie Wilson. Leslie is joined by a very special museum ambassador. Hi, everyone. My name's Leslie, and I'm a vet tech here at Carnegie Museum of Natural History. I am joined today by my friend Quilliam Penn, the African pygmy hedgehog. We're talking a lot about animals that have armor, and Quilliam is an example of a mammal that has armor to protect himself. So if you can see, and I can also feel, down the back of Quilliam, he has these really kind of sharp, modified hairs that help to protect him. Those hairs are made out of keratin, which is a type of protein that makes up our hair and our fingernails too. Theirs is just a little different because it makes their hairs pointy and sharp so that they can protect themselves. If you'll notice, Quilliam is not completely covered in quills. They're only down his back. And so he's got some nice fuzzy hair in his belly so he can tuck his tail and his face and turn himself into a big pokey ball. He can use the muscles on his back to stick those quills out in all different directions, offering him really good protection from any predators. African pygmy hedgehogs spend a lot of time where it's really hot, and it's a difficult environment to survive in. 
So Quillium spends most of his day sleeping so that he can come out at night when it's a little bit cooler. And a lot of his prey items, like insects and other bugs and slugs, that's when they like to come out too. So he likes to sleep all day and party all night. Quillium is a member of our living collection. We have a collection here at Carnegie Museum of Natural History that includes 15 animals representing 13 different species from all around the world. Thank you so much, Leslie and Quillium. Now let's learn about another group of animals that has armor, turtles. Like this extinct tortoise in dinosaur armor. Look at the size of that shell. To learn more about turtles, let's go to museum educator, Pat McShay. Hi, I'm Pat McShay. I'm an educator here at Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and I'm gonna be talking about turtles. It's a safe bet that whatever your interest level is, even if it's low, you know something about turtles. I'm holding a taxidermy mount of a, what's called a wood turtle, a turtle found in Pennsylvania. Uh, parts of it are real. The shell is real, the skin is real, but inside all the guts have been removed. So it's gonna be something that can stay in the shape it is, give you a real good idea of what a turtle looks like close up without smelling bad or rotting. What you know about turtles already is they've probably got uh, four legs coming out of a shell head on one end and tail on the other. But for many people, how that shell is built is brand new information. It's shocking to some people that the shell is bony on the inside. The spine is part of the shell, and the ribs come out from the, from the spine or backbone, and the ribs fuse. That's what creates a shell. So the, the shell for a turtle is not an accessory it's part and parcel of the animal's skeleton structure. This is a shell from a snapping turtle, a turtle that is found in Pennsylvania, and they can get a little bigger than this, but this is a fairly big one. The skull is also pretty interesting. This is from yet a third turtle, something called an alligator snapping turtle, not found in Pennsylvania. You probably have to go south, at least to South Carolina, Florida or Georgia to find one of these. But it's an amazing, sturdy structure. And one of the things you can notice when you examine it close enough is that the space where the brain would be is pretty small. At the museum, we walked upstairs from this lab. We could go into the part of dinosaurs in their time called the Cretaceous Seaway. In the Cretaceous Seaway section of dinosaurs in their time, there's an enormous fossil of an ancient sea turtle called Protostega. And that turtle is, has a shell about the size of the hood of a car. Um, the fossil record tells us that there have been turtles in the ocean on Earth as long as 250 million years ago in the Triassic period. From that point, in the exhibit, from when you've got a good look at Protostega, it's a short walk into the area we call Discovery Base Camp, where overhead there's an equally enormous cast of a sea turtle that is still alive in the oceans today, a leatherback sea turtle that the real parts of it are in the scientific collection here, but the cast gives you a very good idea of the enormous size of turtles today. If you were interested in what's in Pennsylvania's woods and fields and water. The second floor of the museum is a good place to stop. Among an exhibit of Pennsylvania amphibians and reptiles is a case that has all 13 species of Pennsylvania turtles displayed as taxidermy mounts. They're displayed naturally in sort of a wet pond edge. It's not a way you'd ever encounter all 13 species together but it's an excellent three-dimensional field guide for comparing size, coloration, and body type of the turtles that are around here. Thanks so much, Pat. We have so many specimens that you can see on display in our exhibits, but there are so many that you can't see that are behind the scenes in our collections. 
for that, we're gonna turn to our herpetology team and a behind the scenes look at one of our very special spaces. Welcome to the alcohol house. We are in a part of the museum that not many people get to see. I am Jen Sheridan, the curator of Amphibians and Reptiles. And I am Stevie Kennedy Gold, the collection manager in the section of Amphibians and Reptiles. And the alcohol house here was built in 1907. It's one of the oldest parts of the museum. And like we said, not many people get to come back here. So we're gonna give you a little bit of a behind the scenes tour. What many people don't know is that we have a scientific research collection. So behind all these doors, inside all these tanks are scientific research specimens that go back to the late 1800s. And scientists use this in many ways to look at impacts of climate change. We look at changes in species distributions. We use them to describe new species when we find something new and we're not sure if it's the same as something already described or if it's something completely different. We have to compare it to what we know. And we also use them to look at many other questions that we right now probably aren't even thinking about, that new scientists are gonna come up with new questions to ask and answer with these specimens. So it's important that we keep these collections safe and that we continue building our collection for the future. And in this alcohol house, we actually have three levels. So we're just on the first level right now. And in these three floors, we have snakes, lizards, frogs, toads, salamanders, turtles. And we have almost a quarter of a million specimens between the wet specimens you see here in these tanks and in these cabinets and in the jars that we'll look at upstairs, as well as in our bone or osteology collection too. So this is our snapping turtles. We have tanks for the turtles because the turtles are quite big and uh, more difficult to fit inside jars, especially big species like this. And these guys are great examples of armor because they have very, very thick shells. And they also have these great ridges down their backs, which not many turtles have. So these turtles always have these three ridges down here. Uh, Snapping turtles tend to sit on the bottom of rivers and they hunt sort of um, by sitting and waiting. So they're sit and wait predators and they have a great little appendage on their tongues that we'll show you. Uh, and that sort of acts like a little lure so that they can lure fish into their mouths and then use these really, really thick jaws. So they have a really strong bite force. If you were to feel their skull, you would feel how thick and bony this is. So there's not a lot of soft tissue here. It's a lot of really thick, solid bone. So they're a great example of armor in the turtle world. So this is a head and esophagus of a leatherback sea turtle. And the cast of this particular turtle is on display in what we call Discovery Base Camp on the first floor of the museum. And one of the great things about this particular specimen is that you can really see the details in the esophagus. And we have a little jar here that we like to show people too that has these spines. And if you come over and take a look inside this tank, what you'll see is that the esophagus is lined with spines all the way down. And one of the reasons for that is because the main prey of leatherback sea turtles is jellyfish. And while they're eating, as you can imagine, they consume lots of water, but that seawater they have to basically spit out their mouth. So those spines keep the jellyfish in as they're ejecting that seawater after they've swallowed both jellyfish and seawater together. A lot of people think of armor in amphibians and reptiles being exclusively to reptiles, but frogs also have some armor as well. So one of the species that I really love is this species called Polypedates otolophus. And otolophus basically means file ear. And so if you take a close up look 
at the side of their head, they have this bony projection. And if you feel it, you can tell that the skin on the top of their head is actually fused to their skull. So there's no soft tissue between the skin and the skull. So they have this really bony skull. And there's not a lot known about why this would have evolved in this particular species. There's no other species in Southeast Asia where they live that has this to this degree, at least in Borneo. Um, but I do know a fun fact about this particular species, which is that they will eat other species of frogs. And I've seen this live once or twice, and it's really impressive. Another really interesting thing is that a lot of people think of venomous amphibians and reptiles being just things like snakes. So venomous means that an organism can inject poison into something else. And so obviously snakes have fangs and they do that a lot. But this frog has poison glands on its head and little spines. And what scientists found, this occurs in Brazil, they found that this frog will actually kind of like move its head in a way that it will inject the toxins into something that's trying to eat it, basically. So it's technically a venomous frog, and there's only two species that I know of that are considered venomous frogs, and this is one of them. They're both from Brazil. They've got these little tiny spines on the surface of their head. If you feel it, it's nice and kind of bony and prickly, um, and so they will inject those toxins into another organism. So not only reptiles have some kind of defensive armor amongst the amphibians and reptiles. So what we have here are some reptiles that have really cool armor features. Now oftentimes when we think about reptiles and armor, you might think about the turtle with the giant shell or alligators and crocodiles with those cool osteoderms all along their back that folks actually used to turn into human armor. But little lizards also exhibit types of armor too. So what I have here is Phrynostoma solaire. Now these guys are really fun, because if you can see, they have these beautiful crowns along their heads of thorns, or horns, or spikes, and they look really scary. And, you know, if you chomp down on it, you probably won't feel too good in your mouth. They live in the desert, and they usually just sit on the ground like little bulldogs in the area, and all those spikes try to look like a deterrent. But let's say that a predator does come and try to eat you. Well, different types of phrynosoma or horned lizards have a really cool ability to shoot blood out of their eyeballs. So not necessarily armor, but a really good deterrent. Now, other species of lizards, like these armored lizards, or excuse me, armadillo lizards, are really neat. Their scientific genus name is Ouroboros, and Ouroboros implies a circle, like a snake eating its tail. So what these lizards will do will actually bite their tail and curl up into a ball. And hopefully you can see all the cool armored scales along their back and those stick up and out again to be really nasty to chomp down on. So lizards have many adaptations, snakes do too, but again, in general with reptiles, scales are armor. They're really thick, they're really strong. Some species of snake, like this one here, Calabria, have actually thicker scales than most to really help with that armored defense. Thank you, Jen and Stevie. I hope you enjoyed that special behind the scenes look at our herpetology collection, or the section of amphibians and reptiles. So for a final look at another group that uses armor, we talk about humans. And for that, we're going to talk to Dr. Lisa Haney, an Egyptologist who studies culture. Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Haney. I am an Egyptologist here at Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Uh, an Egyptologist, for those of you who might be wondering, is someone who studies the history, writing, religion, and material culture of the different groups who settled along the Nile Valley. My particular area of specialty is ancient Egyptian archaeology and material culture. And what material culture is, is all of the different kinds of things that the ancient Egyptians and ancient Nubians left behind um, that we're able to study and to learn from today. The ancient Egyptians used coffins like this one and amulets as a kind of spiritual armor that would have served to protect the body of the deceased so that their spirit might be able um, to come and live there in the afterlife, protecting the physical body 
of um, a, a, a person who had died was really, really important because without your body for your spirit to live in, you wouldn't be able to reach the afterlife. Um, and this particular coffin, which dates to the early Roman period, shows us just how influential nature and animals were in ancient Egyptian religion and thinking. If you actually look at the coffin, you can identify a number of different types of animals. Here around uh, the crown of this individual's head, you see a bunch of uraei, which are cobras that are raised up. And the cobra represents the goddess Wajet, who's the goddess of Lower Egypt. You can also see right here across the chest of the individual, a winged scarab, which links to the sun and represents the Egyptian god Kepri. Below that, you see a bird with a human head, and that's a representation of the Ba. And the Ba is another one of the spiritual elements of a person in ancient Egyptian culture and something else that needed to be protected in the afterlife. And your Ba was a part of your spirit that would fly out during the day and then come back to rest inside your body at night. So that's one of the reasons why these types of spiritual armor were so important. We also have down below some crocodiles and other animal-headed gods. You can see on the sides representations of the falcon god Horus. So animals and the natural world really played a major part um, in ancient Egyptian life and religion and were a really big inspiration for them. Today we've seen examples of armor in nature, adaptations that have evolved in different animal groups over time that help them survive in different ways whether by helping to protect them from predators, defend their territory, or communicate to other members of their own species. We only had time to show you a few examples from around the museum, though. Did we miss your favorite animal armor? We hope you'll come to visit us at Carnegie Museum of Natural History.